I'm sorry we're so very crowded and some people are not sitting in good spots for hearing. So if you can't hear, just yell louder. Because we have, I understand, we have no loudspeakers today except one. I don't know what the title, the proper title for this talk today is, or maybe we can change it later on. Um, I do want to talk about violence. Because having been home during the past off period and not traveling, um, we heard a lot of newscasts, news programs, over TV, where one is so immediately witness to what is going on all over the world. There were these always relatively short and abrupt scenes. One doesn't know what happened before, yesterday, last month, or for the last 10 years, or the last 100 years. So all these little scenes are just cutouts. One of them of a small village in Salvador, which had just been, quote, liberated by troops of the one side from troops that had taken it from the other side. And the people looked exhausted. First they were captured by one liberator, and then they were re liberated by the other liberator, and there were women and children cry and hurt soldiers, dead bodies lying around. Similar scenes from all over. One, one item was a a sheer unlimited number of huge trucks, open trucks, being caravaned through a city in Iraq. With pris Iranian prisoners in it. Young people looking tired, afraid and humiliated in handcuffs. Being trucked through this Iraqi city where people jeered at them abuse them verbally, wave their own flags. This was done to boost Iraqi morale, I guess. Because one heard of a new massacre in Lebanon, where Palestinian children and women were killed as some demonstration for something or other. There were these riots outside of a, a Jewish parliament demanding that one man step down. Of course, half of the rioters were demanding and the others were opposing it. One man got killed in the process. In between this, because it was the 50th anniversary of Hitler coming to power in Germany, 1933. There were flashbacks at what went on then, at what went on then. Some documentaries we saw, <coughs> incredible things. I had never known about them. They happened in my lifetime. I never knew about it. There, one year after Hitler came to power, there was an insurgence of the very stormtroopers, these thousands, hundreds of thousands of stormtroopers who had helped Hitler to get into power. They were now no longer needed because Hitler formed his own, his own more reliable police system or military system, and these eradicated the others, at least the top people, who were just massacred, just killed. They didn't even know why. And many of them were uh, stretching out their hand and saying, Heil Hitler, as they were killed, as they were shot down. There were flashbacks to the Eichmann trial. And of course, a new captive that we have, 
a German who, a member of the Gestapo, did inhuman things there in a city in France, killing, I don't know how many Jews and French underground people, and then escaped to some other country, and now he has been captured, brought back for justice. And it's just aroused all the memories, the French people, not just the French people, many people around the world. We were taken to the living room of two old widow ladies whose husbands had been killed by this man 40 years ago. And they were just raising their arms and said, Justice, justice, justice. We want justice. Kill this man and then justice will have been done. One interesting witness was in the, the Eichmann trial. And this man was being interviewed right now by a newscaster. He survived having lived in the concentration camps. He was a witness at the Eichmann trials in Jerusalem. And actually you saw one scene there during those trials where he <coughs> just passed out. He just, he just dropped to the ground. And he is telling us now in this present day interview what happened to him then. That in looking at this most ordinary of all people, this Eichmann, I forget his first name, was sitting there totally motionless, unmoved, untouched, not defensive particularly. As a matter of fact, he was reported to be most collaborative with his captors to be sure that they took the right safety measures. He was helping out because he could learn. He'd been pro programmed to always help those who were in charge always collaborate, always cooperate, always do what he was told. Blindly, totally blindly. And this one man there who passed out as a witness tells us now that at this moment, in looking at this man there, it struck him. very powerful, powerful enough for him to pass out, that this was him, that he could have done the same thing, given the same circumstances. There was no difference between him and me. Of course, during these programs, you always hear somebody say uh, during the, the trial, let's have this so that this will never happen again in the world, so that the world will be spared this, so that we can learn from it. But looking at the world today, we haven't learned anything. The same things are going on everywhere, all the time. Not everywhere at all the time, but here today and there tomorrow. Flaring up here today flaring up on the other side of the globe tomorrow because it's the same, same human beings. He was this one man who looked for a moment without anything interfering. When we, when we witness these, these newscasts, these scenes, or hear about it or read about it in the newspaper, how, we, how do we approach all this? What's our attitude toward this? <coughs> do we immediately have a reaction how horrible it is out there, the world? Or do we open up to it? Look at all of this, at all the people that are involved. These are all people, like us. What happened to them? What's going on there? And what's going on inside? I have to watch that.
when I see some a scene on television or read about this, I want to know what is going on there. And I have to look inside what's going on. First of all, my reaction's coming up of trying to label it as wrong or bad. A superior attitude, this could never happen to me. Judgment, revulsion. I've got to see this all. And where does this all come from? Who am I? And who is he or she? Who are we? How do we live? How do we relate to each other? Daily. What is the, what is the raw material of all this? For all these happenings in the world since time immemorial. seems more acute than ever today, maybe because we have more information. Maybe that because there are more sovereign states, the tiniest are sovereign states now, which means immediately an army, a defense system, and trying to secure the borders against neighbors, or invade a little because this piece really used to belong to us. We get a, we get a newspaper sent to our home from a, an organization called Amnesty International. It is amazing that there seems to be no country in the world in which torture isn't going on. People arrested to pry information from them or to punish them or to intimidate them. So what is the raw material in human beings that makes all this possible? I want to go down deep enough so I come, come on to not what is personal about me and you, we can live and look at that and then forever just all be different entities. We're so different from each other and because that's universal too, that we're all different from each other. But what is it deep down, the raw stuff, just like this, these fires which are raging right now through Australia? There couldn't be fires if there wasn't material to burn. There wasn't the stuff there to catch fire, to, to consume and to pass it on. Isn't it basically most fundamentally selfishness? Selfishness, self-centeredness in every human being. And that you can observe clearly in yourself from moment to moment. Self-centeredness, selfishness, this constant whirlpool of it, going around and around. We observe it for a while, and then we get so um, aghast at it, we don't want to look at it anymore. But that's the self, too, that doesn't want to look. Wants to see something different, a, a better scene. But this is where we need to look, because change only happen, comes out of seeing, out of nothing else. So there's self-centeredness, self-seeking. There's an immense drive seeking pleasure. not just the pleasure of sensuous things. And let's exclude from here the things we need to survive, to live healthily, like food, keeping warm, having clothes and so forth, having a house to live in. We're leaving that alone. We're looking at what's extra. And this pleasure takes so many forms not just the pleasure of drinking or smoking, sex. There's one outstanding pleasure talking about what we are looking at this morning is the pleasure of power. Power of position, power over other people. And you say, I, I, this is nothing for me. I don't want to, to wor work over anybody, have people work for me. I don't even like it. I don't, don't like to tell people what to do. 
but with your family, with your husband or your wife, or your friend. It's, isn't there? Aren't there power games going on? Who's winning? An argument? I don't want you to tell me what to do. Over a child? So that child says, yes, mom. Yes, mommy. Doesn't that feel good? He's obedient. Maybe it just feels good because there's no ob objection and I don't have to deal with that. Oh, everything all is all clear. He says, yes, mom. Or is there also this fe feeling good because someone says, yes, mom, I'll do that. What you say, look at it. Some people have dogs. I watched them. We have a, a big open yard in, in front of our house. People walking their dogs or training them. There's so often something extra, not just having the dog be careful not to uh, to defecate on the neighbor's lawn. Actually, that's where the least attention is being, being uh, given. You've got this stuff all over the place. But this thing of uh, having this dog come back to you and heal, I don't know all these words, the whole vocabulary, its own. The feeling of having someone in my paw. You may not do this, then, but, but you can look at it, can't you? And detect these things, because they're not just very blatant. Some of them are very hidden, very subtle, innocuous. Yet, well, they will be exposed in, it, in, in attention. It's careful and really it doesn't want to blind itself to anything. It's going on here, because what goes on here has the world in a mess. And mess is an understatement. Just as there's this tremendous drive for pleasure, there's a tremendous fear of pain. Fear. Not just of pain. Fear of being standing there insecure, unsafe, unprotected. And this fear in human beings is the, maybe the most important conditioning, <coughs> conditioning uh, factor, conditioning power. If you're af afraid, you will do things. That fear will dictate actions to you. Try to find shelter. Try to find protection. Try to find strong men or strong women who seem to, to have that protection and shelter or establish it. You seek your refuge. And a lot goes with it. Going along with what these people say and advocate. We, we, we trade things in for the protection we think we're getting. Trade in independent thinking. Independence. Freedom. Freedom to stand alone. We can't stand it, so... We trade it in. And then follow, as one person once mentioned here, follow the party line. We do this individually. And it happens in the country. In this one docu documentary movie, which was called the affair hummingbird that was this where Hitler erad eradicated his rival there, the man who was the head of the stormtroops, Röhm. There were some interviews with people who had survived this whole, this whole thing and are still living today. And one man said after that happened, after these hundreds of Leading SR people were massacred, killed, without any process of law, of course. There was no process of law. Hitler said they're dangerous, they have to be killed, so they were killed. So this one man said, after that, terror reigned, fear reigned, and we did everything that this man demanded and said. Everything, without question. Anybody who's lived 
left in Germany. Tasted that fear to one degree or another. I was totally deformed by it, mentally or physically. If you look at the man himself, these, these scenes there where he stands on this little platform and just humanity like organized ants underneath him, all over. It, it, it couldn't just be a small amount, it had to be hundreds of thousands of people in a pattern there, in a very orderly pattern. All he could do is scream. Scream in, in, in anger. In anger. And threat. There was not a smile on his face. What a life to live. A life of constantly being fed by a pool of anger, f fear, violence, and brutality, which was inexhaustible. Or so it seemed. If you look at, look at that without any at this person without any rancor, not immediately demanding justice or feeling too bad he killed himself, he should have been tortured. Some people have said that. Some people have said these people should have gone through the same torture as what they put other people through. Why? What, what, why? What for? Is it at all possible to, to look at every human being with an open, compassionate, no mind? No mind meaning nothing stored up, no rancor, no demand for justice. Another raw material we were, we were talking about, fear, selfishness, lust for power, is this, it seems innate, instinctive drive for vengeance. You can already see it in little children. You do this to me, I'll do this back to you. Because often parents say, you hit him right back. You take his toy if he takes yours. We do instill this very early. We do instill everything in our children. If we don't do it, the teachers to do it, what we haven't done. School teachers or military teachers, church teachers, always uh, indoctrinating, indoctrinating. How to live in this society so as to be a good citizen, a useful citizen for the aims and purposes of the society. So vengeance, watch it, you can watch it so clearly in yourself. Somebody says something critical of you and the first uh, reaction is, well, you're doing the same thing. Always away from here, where it may hurt, where I may have to look at something, may have to let go of something, but I don't want to let go of anything because I need all that, because that's me. I want to leave me intact. My image of myself, I want to leave that intact and rather find fault and do my labor of love on other people. So this, uh, uh, this is a form of vengeance, I just said, can take much uh, more powerful forms, much more brutal forms. You've done something to me and I will not forget this until I've had my vengeance. Partly what aided this whole movement of Hitler long, the 
vengeance for humiliation that had happened to Germany after the war. And then someone exploiting that, telling the people how humiliated <coughs> they have been and, and, and trying to get energy out of them for a new protest movement, someone in, in power. So can one all the time, all the time, as one sees a program like this, read something in the paper, watch one's reactions to it, and where do they come from? And watch oneself. It has to be both. One, if one is totally absorbed just in self uh, introspection or whatever you want to call, it, then you become very much self enclosed, and you become very important to yourself, of the most uh, greatest importance. And one ignores what is going on, and what is one's relationship to this world. Maybe we have something to do with each other. Maybe we bring each other forth. We do. And if that is seen, then there's a totally different way of living, not with blame and guilt and vengeance, which absolutely leaves, leaves no room for love. Love can't can thrive there at all. It can't be there. We've, we've talked about selfishness, self-centeredness, as though it was the individual person. Because that's there. One is for oneself. I come first. I gotta have the biggest peace. And all the emotions that are aroused if somebody crosses our uh, plans and we are angry at this person, are in a fight. But the self <coughs> and selfishness, self-centeredness also applies to the group <coughs> with, with whom we're identified. Because we are. We're identified with our family. My family is me, if we have reasonably good relations. Or my the group, my club that I belong to, it's me. And somebody attacks it, and I defend it. Or I go out defending others to rouse some energy for the club. Religions, we're, we're identified with our religion. It become, becomes my big self. It's still the self. It's still selfishness that operates. I want this to be supported, this to be the only one, this to win over others, or my ideology, and my country. Are you identified with this country? Is this your country where your blood will beat a little bit faster if the national anthem is played? There's a big parade bringing some war victors back. Ladies and gentlemen, the president and so forth, everybody rises. And you say, no, nah, this, this doesn't move me at all. And yet, what, what if this country is attacked? By Cuba? Wouldn't, wouldn't most people rise to arms? We, we, we always hear this. When this country is in trouble or under attack or in a crisis, then we'll put down all our bipartisanship and we'll all stand together as one. As one what? As one entity in antagonism and opposition to another, ready to fight verbally or physically, ready to destroy, ready to kill, in the name of the country, the flag, which are all abstractions, they are all ideas. Going with the, these super-selves, 
my church, my country, my group, my center, goes something else, and that is a conviction. Test it out for yourself. Look if, if this isn't so. A conviction that this is the best, this has the, the truth, the most this or that leader, biggest membership, whatever. And that, that goes more with this. If there's this real conviction that we have the truth, oh, do you see how dangerous that is? We have the truth, therefore we have something that we can give you. Or maybe that we have to give you, that is our duty. To spread this around. To give it to others. And the other danger is that if this is the absolute truth that we have, we're not going to question it. We, we don't have to question it. Because we've already declared it absolute truth. It is ingrained in our mind as being that, so we're not questioning it. Which means our vision is not free. It is already through this pattern of something ingrained there, which is absolute. Absolute truth. And if this is ingrained in the mind, the mind is distorted. And it has to look at things in a distorted way. It has to distort evidence to fit what has already been established as being so, namely absolute truth. Do you see, do you see how dangerous this is and how, how divisive? We saw a scene, a, a, a movie about Taiwan. There's now a new, whole new generation of Taiwanese who grew up, who've never been on the mainland. The mainland to them is, a, is an abstraction. And yet they're still being inculcated in their schools that they're going to recapture the mainland sometime or whatever. That this is really China, this is where they belong, and there's of course enormous armament. It was mentioned that there is not another piece of real estate that is as much defended and armed as this little, these few little islands there, and they were, the camera was looking right into, the, into these cannon things coming out of the rocks. And that, yet there are some people there who, who, who are beginning to question this, whether there couldn't be a separate Taiwan and drop all this hostility. And there is suppression of that going on. One man is in a prison who is advocating a separate Taiwan, because the, the introduction of the program was that this is the one flourishing democracy in, in, in Asia, because they have capitalism and they showed kids eating hamburgers and french fries. <laughs> <laughs> Happily, kids love it. <laughs> to them it's dessert. <laughs> and yet, there are people who are in prison because they're saying, let's have a separate Taiwan. On the other side, of course, what the Taiwanese are propagating and advertising is the unfreedom in mainland China because every child gets indoctrinated about communism, but it's not different, really. On the other side, we indoctrinate our children in freedom and they indoctrinate their children in unfreedom. Well, what is that freedom that you indoctrinate someone? That freedom can't be indoctrinated. Freedom means you can say what you, what you need to say, and much more than that. Just freedom to speak is not the only freedom. It's freedom from self, from this sheer bottomless power of, of self, which is generated by this idea that I am a separate entity, and whatever I am associated with is a separate entity has its own uh, separate reason for being, and in many cases it's, it's, it's the keeper of absolute truth and the disseminator of absolute truth.
which makes all intercourse, all communication, shuts it right off. All open, growing, learning relationship. Because I've already taken this ahead out of identification with oneself, with one's group, one's church, one's political party, with one's country, grow images. So we see ourselves as Americans or as Christians or Muslims. could talk about that movie too. We'll do it another time. This movie Gandhi, which showed in so plain images what is going on in the world. Trying to live up to this ideal of, of non-violence and violence erupting again and again because human beings do not change because of an ideal. No ideal has ever changed anybody. It just makes you fanatic or peaceful, in quotation marks, for a certain time, as long as the leader is there, visible, and sort of exuding his whatever. Once he's not there, everything is there as it was before and breaks out and there's killing. Muslims killing Hindus. And after that, there was this enormous bloodbath in Bangladesh. Nothing had been learned about nonviolence because people didn't look into themselves to meet it there head on without any ideal coming in between. To see it in all its manifestations from the surface to the bottom and see it so clearly without any escape and without any condemnation and not accepting it. Just the seeing. And there may be a change. Not in any other way. Find out for yourself. I'm not trying to put an idea over. Everyone has to do this for herself or himself. No one can do it for us. No leader can do anything for us. Maybe point some things out, but you have to see them and do them and test them in your relationship with people in the smallest circle or wherever you are. So observe all the images that you have of yourself as being this or that, coming out of your affiliation and association with groups and countries and ideologies and movements. See what these images do for you or what, what you would be without them. And do you want to be without do you want to be without images? Can you? And the same applies to, to the people we're relating with. They have images of themselves, but how do we see them in terms of what he belongs to or she belongs to? You can't see the person. You absolutely cannot see a person if you have already a label there in your mind. He's this or she's that. You can't listen, you can't see. Touch, feel, hear, experience directly. And it's the only way in which we can survive together in a loving, live fashion. by exploring ourselves and listening to each other without labels, identifications. The, in this movie, there, there was one scene where a, a Hindu came to Gandhi who had murdered a Muslim child. He probably had murdered more people, but that was the, the main issue there. And the reason he had done it was because the Muslims had murdered his child. And he couldn't contain his anger and, and uh, urge for revenge, and, and this whole thing took place. What, what was advised by the old man was that he, the Hindu, raise a Muslim child. 
pick any Muslim orphan and raise it as a Muslim. Because as you hear this, you think, what a formidable task this would be, and how educational. You were so prejudiced against these people. You've killed them. You're just done killing them. The blood is still on your hands. To take one of these children and raise them as your... No, not raise them as your own, make them a Hindu, but raise them as a, as a Muslim. It means you have to find out what Islam is all about, what the rites are, the ceremonies, the teachings. But, you know, for the moment this seems okay, but what's going to come of it? It would be far better to raise a child as nobody, no one. And oneself being that, because you cannot be with a child unless you yourself are free from that. Unless you have your allegiances, you're going to implant them in the child. You may say, I'm not, I'm a free thinker, and you may tell the child that, but underneath, other stuff comes out unconsciously unless you, unless you watch and you're on the alert. Tolerating religious divisions does not end the religious divisions. It doesn't end them. And as was shown in this movie, one spark and the thing, the Holocaust is on again. Hindus against Muslims, who were still marching in under the banner of non-violence. I brought a book here from which I've many, many years ago read a scene and will do so again today. It's a book written by Bruno Bettelheim, very well-known, still living psychologist, psychoanalyst, who found himself quite early in the game in, in the um, concentration camps I think he was in two of them. The book is called The Informed Heart, Autonomy in a Mass Age, is the subtitle, Autonomy in a Mass Age. This one scene, actually, more than anything, as a matter of fact, I don't remember much of the rest of the book, but this book, this one scene, when I read this book, uh, 25 years ago, so stuck out. So I'll read it to you. Let me illustrate with the following example. In the winter of 1938, a Polish Jew murdered the German attaché in Paris from Rat. So just to make a side comment on this, I remember this incident when it happened. It was first reported in the newspapers, and we were horrified because we knew now that this had happened, something enormously horrible would happen to all the Jews. And it was quite clear, too, probably my parents saying this to us, or maybe I already thought this myself, I don't know, that anything could be staged by the government at any time if a pretext was needed for a, a new action. In other words, one could just say, this Jew murdered this German, and therefore now all Jews have to be eliminated uh, put into concentration camps, uh, uh, their stores were shattered, um, all the glass was lying around all over the streets, and people were just herded together and shipped away because of this young uh, boy killing a German attaché in a country in which there was no justice, I mean, no system of, uh, of testing this. Well, there was really so of trying to find out. It, it, it just didn't, didn't, wasn't there. The Gestapo used the event to step up anti-Semitic actions, and in the camp new hardships were inflicted on Jewish prisoners. One of these was an order barring them from the medical clinic unless the need for treatment had originated in a work accident. Nearly all prisoners suffered from frostbite, which often led to gangrene and then amputation. 
Whether or not a Jewish prisoner was admitted to the clinic to prevent such a fate depended on the whim of an SS private. On reaching the clinic entrance, the prisoner explained the nature of his ailment to the SS man, who then decided if he should get treatment or not. I too suffered from frostbite. At first I was discouraged from trying to get medical care by the fate of Jewish prisoners who attempted who had whose attempts <clears throat> whose attempts had ended up in no treatment, only abuse. Finally things got worse and I was afraid that waiting longer would mean amputation, so I decided to make the effort. He describes incidentally how everything, rather than just standing still where you were, was an effort. When I got to the clinic, there were many prisoners lined up as usual, a score of them Jews suffering from severe frostbite. The main topic of discussion was one's chances of being admitted to the clinic. Most Jews had planned their procedure in detail. Maybe we should say most people. I always keep harping that these are Jews, because it would have been you and me. Some thought it best to stress their service in the German army during World War I. Imagine standing there. What are you going to say to this guy so that he'll do something for you? Tell him how good you are, what you've done for him, all the good things you've done in the past for this country and therefore for you. Wounds received or decorations won. Others planned to stress the severity of their frostbite. Mine is worse than anybody else's. I really need treatment. I mean, mine is at the, at the most critical stage. This is how the mind operates. A few decided it was best to tell some tall story, such as that an SS officer, that an officer had ordered them to report at the clinic. Most of them seemed to convi seem convinced that the SS man on duty would not see through their schemes. Eventually, they asked me about my plans. Having no definite ones, I said I would go by the way the man dealt with the other prisoners who had frostbite like me, and proceed accordingly. Uh, reading this, there was this first glimpse of the possibility of having no images about something, of oneself or another person, and just looking. Which means no refuge in plans, in thinking about it, which in itself is a refuge, is, a, is an escape to make plans. And I'm not talking about all plans. If you have to go someplace, you have to get tickets and plan on the dates and so forth. But this constant plan, how am I going to meet this? How am I going to do that? Over and over and over. Which bars clear seeing or clear no thinking for a time. No thinking about it, just letting the, all the stuff settle out, which it will and does. Which is why, why we sit at times. Go by the way the man dealt with other prisoners. I doubted how wise it was to follow any preconceived plan, because it was hard to anticipate the reactions of the person you didn't know. In other words, no image. He's this man, that man, he belongs to this organization, has this uniform on. I don't know this man. It's very, it takes energy. Because images come up habitually. Habit, habit, habit energy is very strong. No habit energy is stronger. It's not, it's not comparative. comparative. When that's there, the other isn't there. free energy of not knowing and not not backing up just meeting the situation <clears throat> not knowing the prisoners reacted as they had at other times when I had voiced similar ideas on how to deal with the guards they insisted that one guard was like another all equally vicious and stupid as usual any frustration was immediately discharged against the person who caused it or was nearest at hand. He, he understood this working of the mind. If you frustrate somebody, you don't fulfill their expectations, then 
frustration will be directed at you. So you don't take that personal. You know this is how it works. He probably observed it in himself. And you don't have to take it personal and, and bite right back. You listen to a person full of frustration and anger. You embrace it. Because you don't need to take it personal. You know the state of the mind, because you know your state of mind. Maybe not at this instant. At this instant, maybe it's free from that, because there's seeing and listening and no hiding. So, in abusive terms, they accused me of not wanting to share my plan with them or of intending to use one of theirs. It angered them that I was ready to meet the enemy unprepared. No Jewish prisoner ahead of me in line was admitted to the clinic. The more prisoner pleaded, the more annoyed and violent the guard became. Expressions of pain amused him. Stories of previous service rendered to Germany outraged him. He probably remarked that he could not be taken in by Jews that fortunately had the time that fortunately the time had passed when they could reach their goal by lamentation. Again, an image. Because a person may lament, but can't you listen to a lamentation without immediately saying, oh, that's typical Jewish lamentation. <laughs> Maybe the image comes up, but can you dispel it? Can it be dispelled? Then you can really listen, and maybe the lamenting will stop. <laughs> maybe not. You're not there to stop people. We're there to be there. Because we're everyone. When my turn came, he asked me in a screeching voice if I knew that work accidents were the only reason for admitting Jews to the clinic. And if I came back because of such an accident, and if I came back because of such an accident, I replied that I knew the rules, but I couldn't work unless my hands were freed of the dead flesh. Since prisoners were not allowed to have knives, I asked to have the dead flesh cut away. I tried to be a matter of fact, avoiding pleading, defense, deference, or arrogance. No pleading, no deference, and no arrogance. Matter of fact, can one be that way? No image of the power of this man, just seeing him as a man. Because at that moment, that's all he is. You can, of course, see what he's linked to. Think of it. Oh, skull and crossbones and the cap if he was wearing it. But it's just, it's just a symbol. Man is probably as afraid as everyone else. And therefore, as identified with whatever he thinks gives him strength because he can't muster it himself. He replied, if that's all you want, I'll tear the flesh off myself. And he started to pull at the festering skin because it did not come off as easily as he may have expected, or for some other reason he waved me into the clinic. Inside he gave me a malevol malevolent look and pushed me into the treatment room. It's interesting, he didn't... In a way he just did this. The, the, the situation itself sort of demanded it. He still didn't want to do that, but he went along with the, the whole matter-of-factness of it. There he told the prisoner's or prisoner orderly to attend to the wound. While this was being done, the guard watched me closely for signs of pain, but I was able to suppress them. As soon as the cutting was over, I started to leave. He showed surprise and asked why I didn't wait for further treatment. I said I had gotten the service I asked for, at which he told the orderly to make an exception and treat my hand. After I had left the room, he called me back and gave me a card entitling me to further treatment and admittance to the clinic without inspection at the entrance. It's 
going to read uh, from another biography, this time of the French blind teacher, Le Ciron, received from someone a new publication. But I've also been told by people that the talks are too long. <laughs> so, it's always good to have something in reserve <laughs> <laughs> for another talk. If you have questions about what is being brought up, because right now you can't say, wait a minute, what are you saying there? I don't understand, or I don't see it that way. Write it down and bring it to a question period. We will have one, of, one or two of those hmm? during this on period, and we'll discuss it further. We're not speaking here to, to put a line over on you, or, in, or anything of that nature. We're looking at things ourselves, we're looking at them together. Can one live without images? Which means one has to see them. I say, well, it's my human nature, there's nothing I can do about it. And they'll rule you forever. We'll stop here for today. <laughs>